Joe, you want to do the honors and kick us off? I sure will. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it looks like um, we've got quite a few participants again, so thank you all very much for being here. This is kind of a, a series of webinars that we're doing focused on building science. Uh, last week, if you missed it, we really focused on heat, uh, heat transfer, heat flow, and uh, this week we're going to look at air movement. So uh, you are talking to Joey Starr. I'm a technical project manager at Southface. Uh, we did, uh, oh, excuse me, let's do a little bit of housekeeping first. Sorry about that. Um, just like last week, uh, you're in listen-only mode. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, use the Q&A feature. Uh, we're already seeing quite a few people using it. Uh, we see you out there, Ray. Thank you and everyone for uh, giving us the sound check there. Um, also, I wanted to point out that you do have access to the handouts feature. You should be able to download these slides uh, that we're working on right now, as well as another document that we think will probably be very useful. Um, and again, with the topic ideas, we saw a lot of great of those. Uh, this webinar is for a general audience. We'll talk a little bit about uh, who exactly is here, but also keep in mind that we have uh, various people, uh, regular old homeowners here. So uh, if the if the topics seem a little bit, uh, you know, 101, this was, you know, again, designed to be kind of an introduction. So uh, let's take a look at that next slide, Mike. Um, I, I know that a few people had questions about this on how exactly to access uh, the handouts feature. I'm by no means an expert in GoTo webinar. I took a little, a few screenshots here. You should see this little panel uh, that you're seeing in the middle on the bottom. Uh, that'll be how uh, it looks uh, usually. And you have to press that little red arrow and that kind of expands uh, the panel out. So you'll be able to change your audio settings uh, if you're having trouble with that or and also download the handouts and then input any questions there. So uh, you should see something uh, similar to that on your screen right now. Okay, so now without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Joey. We did the introductions last week, so go check out that webinar if you missed it. Mike, how about you? Uh, we had some questions about how to pronounce your last name, so you're, sure you're that, uh, really you're not going to tell us anything about you that nope. you're the kind of the weatherization guru and um, oh, uh, guru. and me. Um, Guru, that's a good word. Yeah, um, my last name is pronounced Barsik, and um, you can have all the fun with that you want to. Uh, I have uh, I come at the the world from mechanical engineering, but I've also built and renovated a number of houses, including our own hundred year old house that um, uh, we'll try to sh share some stories and adventures from. Uh, and again, always want to shout out and appreciate the people that are working hard in this day and age, trying to to keep our our food supply and our health uh, up and running and and again thanks to everybody uh and let's um you know keep plugging away at this we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna win um i thought it was interesting joey that because of this the new times that we're in i don't know about you but i've been uh i've been kind of neglecting shaving so i'm starting to get a little hairier on my face and is that same for you uh i believe so yeah yeah, I was. I kind of got. I got that impression that maybe that was the case. So, okay. Well, thank. Oh, here's a picture of you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyway, um, well, welcome for me and Joey. I think it's probably the big thing. Um, and Joe, anything you want to say about South Face, our organization, and then we'll dive on in. Yeah. If you don't know, you know, South Face again is based in Atlanta, Georgia. We really focus on. Um, you know, helping uh, people, organizations, and businesses in the southeast. But that's not uh, the only place we work in. We're working on projects in Reno, Nevada right now. Uh, Mike, you were just in uh, St. Louis, I believe, and was scheduled to go to Kansas. So we work all across the country. Uh, so we know that we have a, a, a lot of people here from various parts of the country. So, uh, you know, we have a, a slight, uh, I, I'll say, bias to, to the southeast. But that doesn't mean that we, we've forgotten about you folks in Maryland and and other places that have joined the webinar. So yeah. I was um, actually about to go to Nebraska, which I was like excited oh, about because yeah. I'd never been there, but then that got canceled. So um, we have, uh, uh, we tend to work a lot on the built environment. That's that's a big um, core element of the sort of the sustainable work that we do. And we have some great facilities to really showcase green buildings, plus around the corner, uh, a hands-on training facility. So. Enough, enough said about that. Um, and uh, I, 
on the calendar, Joey, where today is the uh, the wait. This can't yeah. be right. Oh, we already did heat transfer. That's right. Yes. <laughs> like, it is, it's, Tuesday. it's Tuesday, Mike. No, I know. Thank again, you. It's, it's, it's hard to keep the day straight. But <laughs> How can I tell? <laughs> heat transfer is done and dusted. We're going to look at airflow uh, today on the 14th. Uh, just in two days, we're going to be looking at moisture. And then next week, uh, a week from today, is insulation quality. And then from there, we're we're really still uh, kind of playing it by ear as to whether this turns into, it's probably going to be a once a week um, ordeal. Uh, and we're still trying to decide whether that's uh, Tuesday or Thursday. We'll have that news, uh, we hope, by the, by, um, the webinar that occurs on Thursday so that we can kind of uh, update, uh, uh, update that for you. I definitely like that you call this an ordeal. I thought that was that was fun. Um, I, I hope hope uh, this is useful to you. We also want to just again make a pitch. There's some great information at southface.org, um, particularly some new stuff that we put out about the Georgia Energy Code, some videos and some field guides and other good good tools. So with that said, let's just do a quick thing of of who's in the house today. And uh, and Joey, can you take over and and Run yes, the polls. Uh, we should uh, have the uh, the poll on your screen right now, and it looks like um, about twenty percent of you have figured out how to how to click the button. So <laughs> again, um, about half so far. It looks like about forty five percent are from weatherization, thirty uh, percent designers and contractors, thirteen uh, percent hers and DET. Uh, we'll go ahead and close this down. It looks like about two thirds of you have uh, have voted. So um, you should be able to see uh, the results on the screen now. Um, they're a little bit small on my screen, but uh, hopefully you can kind of see that. So again, uh, a little uh, focus on weatherization and designers and contractors. So uh, I'm going to hide that, and you should have control again, Mike. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Well, we're going to dive in, and again, um, in the context of the first three webinars that we're doing, we're really focusing on kind of fundamentals of building science. So we've talked about heat transfer, today is air movement, and then uh, moisture. And then from there, we're gonna build into more specific applications. And uh, we've got a whole, we got some great feedback and we will continue to accept feedback of, of topics, of suggestions, whatever, whatever we can do, we wanna make this valuable and useful to you. Um, building science, of course, again, is, is, you know, really applying an understanding of the physics of how buildings perform and using that information to optimize the way they work, the way that we design them. And also we can use that information to diagnose and correct problems. So um, a lot of good information here. And again, just uh, appreciating that where you're located, the, the, the issues may be different and we acknowledge that. Um, and yeah, I would agree with you, Joey, you said earlier, we tend to kind of focus more in the, the hot, mixed, humid climates, but um, we, we try to pay attention to, to other folk, to other climate zones as well and, and other issues. So we thought we'd mention, um, let me get this back, that, <clears throat> oh, I guess before that, again, the house is a system. This is a fundamental concept that we teach in, in virtually all of our classes. The buildings are systems and the interrelated aspects of these systems is what's really important so we're talking about the building thermal envelope that's much of what we'll be discussing today um, is to separate condition from unconditioned space how we actually handle our space heating and space cooling our fresh air systems which uh, in this day and age pretty important to have and um, also um, maybe a little bit about hot water and uh, lights and appliance and other plug loads um, and we, we had this slide up last week too, but I thought we'd kind of try something here. Um, you know, the, the, the people can have some impact on uh, the performance of the home, the performance of the building. And so my question, and this is an open-ended question, is uh, what what is our audience, what do our, our listeners, our viewers today think um, is really going you know, what, what, what degree do the occupants of the building have to, to sort of sway the performance of the building? And I don't know that I have a scientific answer on this, but Joey, you want to kind of discuss our options here and let us know what people seem to be saying? Yeah, so 
if you think it's less than 10%, um, not very few people think that so far. So that's uh, interesting. Uh, a lot of people are landing on uh, 11 to 24, but it seems like uh, about 70 70% 70 think that it's more than 25%. And I'll go ahead and share <laughs> yeah. share that with everyone yeah. there. I um I think it's this is one that I don't know that I have the answer to other than I would say my experience is probably C. <laughs> and um I I just have seen you know more or less very similar or near identical homes with very different um utility results and uh you know this is unscientific uh anecdotal data I'm sharing but I I just feel like uh we we absolutely can see a sway of at least 50 percent and probably a good deal more from that so just um just something to give consideration to and you know maybe we'll do a future webinar that explores that more deeply but anyway thanks for the for the playing that game uh, we're going to do a very quick recap of uh, what we did last week we talked about heat transfer and we use this example of the three methods of heat transfer. We had radiation from a hot surface to a cool surface. We had conduction through a solid material. And then we had, importantly, convection, which was heat transfer through a fluid. And that fluid is generally in a house or a building air. And so convection uh, is, is ties in very nicely because that's what this whole air movement uh, discussion today is really tying into is, is convective heat transfer. So here, here kind of a classic, it's like a cold weather example of the house with the wall insulation and ceiling insulation. You can see lots of leak paths here. And the one leak path that they kind of don't highlight here, but I'm going to uh, add is that the duct system itself is also part of your home's air barrier. So if the ducts leak, um, that's a mechanical penalty, but it's also a house leak. And then finally, um, we did mention this last week too, the idea, uh, the idea that warm air wants to rise up, cool air wants to fall, and that can create a natural circulation effect called a convective loop. So I just thought we'd kind of recap that. Um, we also very quickly went over how the, the thermal envelope can be defined in more than one way, um, that we have you know, identical looking houses and the thermal envelope is the insulation and the air barrier and it separates condition from unconditioned space. And it can be very conventional like you see in example one, it may or may not include the foundation. Um, it could even include a cathedralized or a vaulted ceiling or even a foamed roof line. So lots and lots of different ways to tie this in and there are pros and cons to these, but all these can be made to work and all of them can unfortunately not work well if things are done poorly. So the air barrier itself <clears throat> is part of the building thermal envelope. It ties in with the insulation. They need to be both continuous and they need to be touching each other um, and or co-located. I like that. Um, and, and our experience is generally the holes are not so much in the wall or in the ceiling as they are at the junctions. That's really a kind of a key failure point that we see in a lot of buildings. And then I did, I did think this was interesting. They're showing in this particular example, the air barrier is on the inside uh, of the wall. There, first of all, there's no harm in having more than one air barrier. Uh, but also my experience is that on new construction, I find the primary air barrier, I'm gonna use that word, is ideally the sheathing. If you can make the sheathing tight and seal the seams and the penetrations of the exterior sheathing, and then of course the plates at the top and bottom, that wall is going to be super tight. Uh, on existing homes, a lot of times you don't have access to the sheathing. So in that case, uh, we probably are going to focus on the inside, the drywall or the plaster or whatever, because we can get access to it. Nothing wrong with having more than one air barrier. The main thing is that it's, it's continuous. Okay, so here we go. Joe, are you excited? We're going to dive into the air leakage. And uh, all right, so... The basic concept here, this is not too complicated. In order to have air leakage, you have to have two things. You gotta have a pathway or a hole, and you gotta have something that creates a pressure difference across that hole. And as you can imagine, if you have a bigger hole or a bigger pressure difference, you're gonna have more air movement. And likewise, if you can reduce the pressure difference or get rid of the holes, which is 
the more practical approach is to get rid of the holes, then you can reduce unwanted air leakage. So that's the moral of the story. Pretty basic, pretty understandable. A couple other key concepts. Airflow is uh, typically going to be measured in CFM or cubic feet per minute. Joey, what are the dimensions of a cubic foot? One foot by one foot by one foot. Or we would have accepted 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 oh. inches. That, that's pretty good, yeah. So, uh, you know, I always kind of use, in, in my mind, I'm looking for something. It's a little smaller than a milk crate uh, is a cubic foot. Um, and, of course, the rule is if a cubic foot of your house air leaks out, what has to happen? A cubic foot of air has to leak in and vice versa. So there's always this sort of conservation of milk crates, if you will. Um, other concepts, airflow is always going to take the path of least resistance, just like you and me. I like that. Um, air is always going to move from high pressure to low pressure. That's a given. Uh, and sometimes there's a temperature impact of that because we know that warm air wants to rise up and likewise cold air wants to fall. So some basic concepts. Um, here you see a house that is positively pressurized with reference to the outdoors. So we're going to see air moving outwards through any holes. Here we see a building that is negatively pressurized. We're going to see air pulled in. Um, and I think hopefully everybody now has that well within their grasp. Flow is from high pressure to low pressure. A couple other terminology. You sometimes hear the word infiltration used. Uh, that technically means air leaking into a building and exfiltration is air leaking out. Uh, you can't have one without the other. So probably just talking about the concept of air leakage, which is, uh, you know, implies both are occurring. That's, that's what really happens. And then um, I want to differentiate that this is uncontrolled sort of random amounts of air movement. And that is very different from ventilation, which is a, an intentional uh, controlled changing out of the air. So that's that's a big difference between infiltration and ventilation. One is intentional and the other is random. Okay, <clears throat> Joe, I hope you're impressed because we were given a, a multi-million dollar budget for animation for, and I really just went to town on this slide. So there are three things that cause pressure differences in a home. Uh, the wind, and okay, so are you ready? The wind is blowing in the graphic here. So the wind, what you, impressive. And oh, of course, yeah. the stack effect, which is warm air rising. Are you watching that? Look at that, it rises wow, up. And then look at that. mechanical fans, which of course blow the graphic in from the side. That was it, right? I think we blew the budget right there, but that was, hope, hopefully we'll get some really good feedback wow. on that. Yeah, is that why you stayed up all night working on this? Yeah, I mean, it was like, it was two all-nighters in a row to get that done, so. Wow. Anyway, um, let's take a look at these in a little more detail, the, the three driving forces. And you'll notice that, you know, wind and stack effect are sort of natural effects, and then fans are, you know, devices we put in. So the first thing is the wind. The wind blows on one side of the house, and it creates a positive pressure as it's pushing. And then as it flows past the house, it creates essentially a low pressure zone, which creates a negative pressure. And when I say that, what I, what I guess I want to mean is the outside is a higher pressure than the inside right here. And right here, the inside is a higher pressure than the outside. So, you know, it kind of can get a little confusing on that. But the wind is, is an obvious effect. Um, some places have a fair amount of it. Some places do not. Uh, and, of course, it obviously varies with the outside weather. So the wind is a driving force. And so is warm air rising. And the term we use is the stack effect or the chimney effect. And um, it wants to rise up and escape out. And then naturally, any a cubic foot of air, you know, this is a classic example. It's winter time. Warm air rises. A cubic foot of air leaks through a hole in the ceiling, maybe a can light. It, a cubic foot of air leaks out. And then it tends, uh, it has to be replaced by one. And the, mo the most negative pressure occurs at the bottom. So we find a leak coming in. I don't know, through a hole in the vented crawl space floor, something like that. So that's a that's a classic pressure profile in the winter time. Um, I love this photo. Uh, I think this really tells a great story. It's a multi-story building uh, in the winter time, and you can see that they've done doing some renovation. There's a tarp right here, and the tarp is essentially billowing outwards at the top. 
So that means it's at a higher pressure. And then at the bottom, what's it doing? It's sucking in. So it's at a lower pressure. And you'll notice that somewhere kind of in roughly the middle, it's hanging down. And we would say that's neutral pressure. So everywhere above the neutral pressure line or the neutral pressure plane, everywhere above it, the pressure in the building is higher than on the outside. Everywhere below it, the pressure is lower. Um, that was pretty cool. We captured the elusive stack effect in the wild in this photo. I think that's pretty neat. So Joey, I have a question for you. If mm -hmm. this window on the top floor was open, which way mm -hmm. would air flow? Out. Uh, that is correct. And then likewise, if this window down here on the bottom was open, which way is the air going to flow? In. That, that's it. You, you, you're two for two. You want to go all for right. the, the grand prize here. All, if this all, that, window, all that practice on Blue's Clues paid there off. There you go. There you go. If this window in the middle, even while the other two windows are open and you've got air flowing in, you've got air flowing out, if the window in the middle is open, what happens? It shouldn't, shouldn't have any effect. Yeah, because there you have a hole, but you don't have any pressure difference. So mm -hmm. assuming there's no wind or no fans or whatever, you know, and I, I just, that, that blew my mind the first time I, I studied that. I thought that was pretty impressive. So that's a, that's a real example of the stack effect in play. Um, we tend to talk a lot about the stack effect in the winter time because it is a function of temperature difference. And you have a bigger delta T usually in the winter than you do in the summer. Um, and obviously, the taller the chimney, the taller the building, the more stack effect you're going to have. So it's more pronounced in that situation. Um, again, sort of the same pressure profile. What I thought was kind of interesting here is, you know, again, this is the winter uh, example. And so I'm going to um, I'm going to flip it around on its head and say, let's pretend this is a tall atrium in Orlando and it's got a ceiling supply register and what happens is the cold air in that case wants to sink so your your pressure profile um, if that's all that's happening your air conditioning supply air is going to fall down and you actually get sort of an inverted um, pressure profile from what you traditionally uh, have seen in you know based on heating so I thought that was just kind of an interesting way to think about that so Hope you didn't get dizzy. Again, another multi-million dollar graphic <laughs> animation right there. So. Yeah, and you, you mentioned too, kind of the, the height of the structure is a big uh, factor in, in here as well. A lot of us work in residential, but even a, a two or a three story house can uh, have a much greater stack effect than a, a one story one. Absolutely. Okay, and then the last driving force is caused by fans. And so this one, we certainly can all relate to if you have us, supply fan or a recirculating fan um, they're going to either put the building under positive pressure or not really change the pressure but an exhaust fan in this example is going to um, pull air from the building so that will put the building under a negative pressure and of course uh, the same amount of air that leaves out the exhaust fan has to be made up by air essentially infiltrating or pulling being pulled in from somewhere else and then this is an interesting one too a lot of people don't think about this but if you have a combustion process and it's tied to your your house um, then that effectively acts like an exhaust fan um, for example if this is a, a wood burning fireplace and um, this you're you're burning logs and there's a you know a roaring flame in here it can be as much as a 300 cfm exhaust the equivalent of an exhaust fan and um, I used to watch this show a long time ago called Mythbusters and I remember they they did one an episode about the myth was does having a fire in this part of your house cause the rest of your house to feel drafty and <laughs> the answer is yes actually it can because um, if you put your house under a negative pressure uh, then you could be pulling air from elsewhere and it does actually you know, sort of decreases comfort in other parts of the home. There are ways to add combustion air to the firebox to help offset that, but that's that's a real factor in a lot of existing homes. Okay, um, speaking of fans, let's go through some typical examples of fans you find in houses and talk about how many CFM we're typically looking at. So we're gonna start off with a bath fan, probably a nominal 50 to maybe 80, 100 CFM. So we'll We'll pick a nominal number for that. 
uh, our, our typical range hood is one to 200 CFM. Again, hopefully always ducted to the outside. A Gen Air type downdraft hood, it's not really a, a hood. It actually has to pull what you're cooking, those, you know, the steam and the odors, or whatever, has to pull those down. So it's working against uh, instead of with the stack effect. So that's significantly higher, anywhere from four or five, maybe 600 CFM on a, on a downdraft hood. And then we have the, I want a shiny stainless steel commercial hood stuck in my house. And, and Joey, guess how big those can be? <laughs> um, I, I, at least 1500 CFM. Yeah, I've, I've seen them six, eight hundred, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500. I actually have seen one that was 2,000 CFM and, and the homeowner did not have makeup air, which is just crazy. So we'll, we'll mention that in a second, but that's a very large hood. And this number, 1,500 CFM, you, we're talking blower door type numbers now. So um, that, that really does need to have some makeup air and um, something to be very much aware of. Uh, and then finally, there's another exhaust fan that a lot of people don't really think about, which is your clothes dryer. And a clothes dryer is usually in the order of a couple hundred CFM. So um, clothes dryers sometimes get a lot of runtime too, so it's not insignificant. Uh, every one of these fans we've mentioned so far, when they operate, they put the home under a negative pressure. Um, the air handler, on the other hand, is typically a recirculating fan. Uh, and we can use a rule of thumb. It's approximately 400 cubic feet per minute for a ton of air conditioner. So, um, uh, you know, a, a nominal two and a half ton, that's a fairly small air conditioner, uh, is going to move about 1,000 CFM. And that means it's pulling 1,000 CFM from the returns, conditioning it, and then putting it back into the house via the supplies. And if everything is done right, there's no there's no negative impact on that. Um, but if you have a problem with the duct system, this could bite you hard. And um, before we go there, I just want to mention um, makeup air for large kitchen hoods. The code today basically says anything 400 CFM or larger hoods you need to have makeup air. Um, some people kind of try to say, oh, you don't need it unless you know, if you have a, as long as you don't have any gas combustion equipment in the house, but no, I think you need it. A big exhaust fan like that. A great resource to go and dive into this more deeply is um, Joe Stever wrote a really good article, uh, buildingscience.com. And if you, uh, I, I like the idea, I'm very much a fan of introducing makeup air near the cook's surface. So I, I want to have an outside air duct with a motorized damper that is wired to the switch. When this hood comes on, makeup air is provided near the cook surface. Um, there's a good little Matt Reisinger video on YouTube about how to do that. I thought it was pretty good. The other thing is roughly whatever the amount of air you're pulling out via your hood, you only want to make up about two thirds of that amount of air. Um, and the, because you actually want some of the air to be pulled from the house, you, you actually want that to happen. So roughly, you know, about two thirds, if that's a 600 CFM exhaust fan, we want to provide about 400 CFM of makeup air. That was a really quick, quick overview of hoods. Uh, again, I would say the biggest, my message on hoods is try to not have such a ginormous hood um, because there's a, you know, no free lunch there. Every CFM you pull out has to be made up by makeup air. Okay, um, we were starting to talk about this. If your air handler is circulating air, you're pulling air from the return, you're heating or cooling it, and you're putting the air back into the house, if everything here is tight and has a clear pathway, then in theory, when, or at least in practice, I guess too, when this fan operates, there is no pressure difference that's created between the inside of the house and the outside of the house. So, you know, a properly functioning, I'll just say that, duct system with an air handler doesn't necessarily create a pressure difference between the inside of the house and the outside of the house. But, Many duct systems leak. And so when you have duct leakage, you can create very significant pressure differences on the home. And so I'm gonna start off with this example showing a leakage in the supply side of the ducts. And rather than throw numbers at this, I thought I would just kind of say, here's a mechanical system. 
it's in a let's say a vented crawl space and we are pulling um all of the air from the house through the return or i guess i should say all the air that the fan is going to get here in the blower is coming from the house via the return some of the now conditioned air is being lost through a supply leak to the unconditioned in this case vented crawl space could just as easily be up in an attic so all the air from the house some of the air thrown away that means only some of the air is put back so if you're only putting back some of the air but you're pulling out all of the air guess what kind of pressure that puts the house under joey this is for you to answer <laughs> if Joey was there. Um, um, the answer is negative. So the house is under negative pressure. Uh, when the house is under negative pressure, that means uh, that this, it, it turns out, do the math, the same amount of air we're throwing away right here is the same amount of air that now must infiltrate back in. So if we're throwing away, let's say 200 CFM through a supply leak, that means the house is getting 800, we're returning 1,000, so the house is now under a 200 CFM deficit. So that means you're gonna be sucking in 200 CFM from say the attic. So the supply leak causes the house to go negative. And as you might expect, a return leak does the opposite effect. So in the return system, we're putting all of the supply air from the blower into the house, but only some of the return air comes from the house. The rest comes from the leak. And so if this is a, 300 CFM return leak, that means only 700 is actually being pulled from the house and all 1,000 are put back in. Basically, we're putting in 1,000 and we're taking out 700, so the house is now positive. And um, we're, the same amount that we're sucking in through this return leak is now the amount that must leave or exfiltrate the condition space of the house. So, Duct leakage is a huge player in terms of energy waste, in terms of comfort, in terms of creating unwanted pressures uh, on the house. Okay, uh, we're not out of the woods yet. Even if the ducts don't leak, we could still have a problem. And this is uh, this slide is trying to show some exhaust fans or other things, but um, I think what they're really trying to get at is, this is very common you see in homes that have one single uh, return and then every room has supplies and so if the bedroom doors are closed the bedrooms basically become pressurized and the main part of the house becomes depressurized here's a section in yellow that kind of shows the same thing the air is all being pulled from the main part of the house and a lot of it is being supplied into the bedrooms but there's no pathway for the positive pressure now in the bedroom to work its way back to the central return. Um, and so that, that can be, that can, essentially, if you have a hole in a bedroom, the air leaks out and likewise conditioned air uh, is being thrown away and now unconditioned air is gonna have to be pulled in to replace it. So this return path problem is something that you find in a lot of homes. And um, there's a couple ways to fix this. Here's a couple examples. Um, here, the design called for a duct that was on an interior wall that has a low, re a low duct, a grill on one side and a high register on the other side. And so we're going to essentially, if the bedroom becomes pressurized, the air can bleed its way back to the hallway. And the ducts are offset to kind of <clears throat> minimize sound and, and noise transfer or, or light transfer. Um, there are some aftermarket products. This is kind of a neat one that is designed to go on an undercut of a door. Um, you need about uh, a good rule of thumb is every cubic foot of air, you, every CFM you put into a space, you want about one square inch of return pathway or transfer pathway. So in this example, if you put 90 CFM into the bedroom, you need three by 30, you need a three by 30 inch undercut on your door. Well, these folks make a nice uh, retrofit baffle that you could use, and it it, the, um, it allows air to go through, but it blocks sound and light transfer. And they also make through the wall ones as well. One of the more common retrofits for this is called a jumper duct, where you put a boot and a boot, and you make connection with a short duct. And here's the bedroom 
pressure builds up, it now has a way to bleed back into the main part of the, the hallway where the return is. Okay, last thing we wanna show, and then we're gonna do a quick question, is if you use a blower door, uh, and a lot of people on this call are probably familiar with blower doors, um, is a calibrated fan that we can turn on and adjust the speed, and we can attain a desired test condition, which what we typically do is try to induce a 50 Pascal pressure difference between the inside and the outside. We usually depressurize. And all of the air that is going through the blower door uh, is equal to the air that's now leaking back in. So we can use this device to both quantify, we actually can measure the amount of CFM, and for every home, there's one unique number. How much CFM does it take to depressurize this home to the test condition? And we can also leave it running and find leaks. Um, and so when I say pressure, Pascals, uh, it's a very tiny unit of pressure. It's, it's technically a Newton per square meter. What does that mean? It's about the weight of a post-it note on your hand, so it's not much. The HVAC industry talks, they use this term inches of water column, and if you've got a glass of water and you put your uh, straw in it, put your finger over it, lift it out, if you have one inch of water column in there, um, that's the pressure it's, that uh, is inducing across your thumb. Um, one inch of water column is about 250 pascals. So when we blow it or test, we're actually testing at 0.2 inches of water column. That's, that's our typical test condition. And that roughly translates into about, it's, it's equivalent to as if the wind was blowing on all four walls and the ceiling and the floor, uh, about a 20 mile an hour wind. All right, so Joey, if you're there, I wanna get people geared up for this question. So let's say we're doing a blower door test on our house, we're depressurizing, and you can see the same amount, if a thousand CFM is going out the blower door, that means a thousand has to leak in through all the leak paths. Um, and we're doing this test, we've got the house to minus 50. And so my question is, while this is happening, this, the sink has water in a P-trap, and this is what the P-trap looks like. And so while this is the fan is running, the water in a sink's P-trap will A, be pushed downward by 0.2 inches, B, stay the same, it won't move, C, rise up towards the house by 0.2 inches, or D, rise up towards the house by one inch. And so, Joey, if you're there, let's try the poll. I'm here. Let's see what people answer. Yeah, I got it launched. Uh, results are coming in. I'll let you know. Okay. Sorry, I was muted for a bit there. No, no, it's no big deal. No worries. Um, so it's kind of an interesting concept there of um, what happens to the water in the trap when you do a blower door test. Yeah, looks like about half of the people have um, chimed in here. I'm going to share the results here. Um, it looks like 63% uh, answered C and then a smattering of the other one. So we have a, a plurality, if not a... Um, majority. <laughs> so, what, okay. what do we think here? Uh, is it back to me? Yep. Um, okay, so the answer is C. Good job. And I'm going to toggle right here, and you can kind of see that when the blower door is operating, it's creating a negative pressure in the house. So, your level in your sink P trap will move because of the 50 Pascal pressure difference. It will rise up 0.2 inches. So, good job. Good job. Uh, last comment, and then we're going to look at pictures here, is um, this idea of uh, managing, uh, or, or basically we're going to talk about this a lot more in the session on Thursday about water vapor, but it, as a teaser or whatever, I just want to comment that air sealing does a tremendous job of helping us to control moisture movement because quite a bit of water vapor, humidity, let's say, travels because of air leakage. So if we air seal a home, and we are in a humid part of the world, this is a really good thing in terms of keeping out that unwanted humidity. Likewise, if you're in a very dry part of the world, uh, you, you're keeping out that, let's say, dryness that you don't want. So air sealing really does benefit us in, in, uh, in all climates. Um, and Joey, I think we're basically got through the concepts. The rest of this is a lot of 
diagrams and pictures of air sealing. And I believe I, we kind of started off with mostly new construction, and then towards the end we have some uh, weatherization stuff. I think we're doing okay on time. We're going to dive on in. And uh, I mentioned this earlier, I think on new construction in particular with walls, if you will focus your air sealing effort on the sheathing, uh, that is the, 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 the sheathing of the walls and then the plates, that is, that is how you get walls to be tight. Um, and uh, I, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of trying to use the house wrap as the, the air barrier. I think house wrap is a great weather barrier. Um, I, I, there are some products like that have the weather barrier already attached to the sheathing and then, then sealing the seams. Um, you could do that with house wrap. I just don't find it often done. So I, I prefer if you seal the seams and then cover it with house wrap. This was actually a photo I took in Maryland of some multifamily construction. I thought this was really brilliant where they had sealed the seams of the sheathing and they used house wrap um, at the band areas. And it took a, maybe an 18 inch wide strip of house wrap and taped it and sealed it. I thought that was a, a brilliant use of kind of different materials. So the sheathing seams are sealed, but all the band joist, which is tricky, has been sealed with a, a, a you know, relatively small layer of house wrap. Uh, very nice detail. Um, now we're gonna look at, you know, uh, the, probably if you had to pick a trade that, you know, just you can just about bet is going to create some leaks. Um, it's probably plumbing. And um, this is one that I think uh, is a great picture on the right here because it shows a failure before the house is finished. You can see the leak path of, you know, this is a porch here and this is a tub. It looks like a jacuzzi tub set on a second floor exterior wall and the porch they didn't sheathe it all the way down like they should have. They built the porch. You see the pathway for you know, humid air to get in and get in between the first and second floor right there. Um, or in the winter, obviously cold air infiltrating in. That, that is a, you know, a, a clear failure and um, very likely this home will fail a blower door test if that, that's not addressed. So how do you fix this or prevent this? When you set a tub, you insulate it, and then you, a lot of people use a real thin sealing material like T-ply, thermoply, energy brace. Um, there's a number of ways to do this, but you, you, you air seal before you set the tub. That's it. This is an exterior wall. This is a wall adjacent to the garage. This is an interior wall. They didn't have to do it here. Um, let's see. Again, plumbing. Uh, we'll probably come back to this, but um, you know, kind of a classic leak there of a hole and. Uh, not only is that a large leak path, but it's also a way that uh, critters can get in and out of your house. So this is what we want to see. If that floor is supposed to be insulated, we want to see really good air sealing. And of course, the air barrier set behind the tub as well. And hey, Mike, while you're on that, yeah. um, that's a really yeah. nice diagram there on the left side. Um, and if anyone wants that diagram or many more like it, you can actually download the, uh, one of the handouts says air sealing and insulation key points. Uh, that's a, um, a file that we created with a lot of uh, those type of details very clearly um, drawn out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Good point. And here's an example where they, they did exactly what we want to see, and they were actually able to do the, air, the tub um, drain sealing before the drywall was set on this one. Um, uh, cantilever floor is another kind of classic example. Um, there is no blocking here, and I think we've made this point before that fiberglass uh, is not an air barrier, and nor is it intended. It's never intended to be, and, and when it's dirty over time, that just means it's filtering air leaking through it. So here's some good details. The, when I talk about blocking, this is what I'm looking for right here, this piece. And um, here it's been done, it's been installed. They haven't air sealed it yet. Uh, here they have um, sealed it, and of course they'll insulate it as well. Just trying to put a lot of pictures of, this is one just kind of, we took this to show. Here we used some foam board and then sealed it in. Here we used the wood and sealed it in, and these have not been done yet. This is a cantilever floor uh, over outside air. Um, let's see, here's another classic leak pass. It's, it's a chase. This is a, a duct uh, shaft. Um, and the challenge on this one is 
it's going to be hard to try to fit like a piece of Swiss cheese around this duct right here. This is going to be a bit challenging to do. So it's much better on new construction to have the framers cap the chase. And <clears throat> then you cut the hole you need for your duct work. Then you seal that opening. And then, of course, they're also showing that they sealed these um, top plate penetrations. Uh, can lights are notorious for being uh, holes in your building thermal envelope, both from an air leakage standpoint. You can see the, the leak paths in this fixture, as well as um, bad insulation coverage. Um, there's an infrared image. So by code today, and even on retrofit, this is what I recommend, is just don't try to make a bad light fixture stay. Get rid of it and put in what's called an airtight insulation contact rated fixture that is can be sealed to the drywall and is itself airtight and then can be completely covered with insulation. Um, last thing I want to mention is um, if, if you really want to get a tight house, you go uh, after the top plates, uh, and this is from the attic, and there is a leak. It's a small leak. It's a small gap where the ceiling drywall meets the wall drywall, and that gets taped and mudded, but from the inside. So you can have leakage down the uh, top plate into the exterior wall cap, uh, cavity. And of course, if there's any wire penetrations through there, those need to be sealed and other penetrations in the ceiling drywall. Um, bottom plates need to be sealed. This is a you know a, an easy way to do it. You can just run a bead of caulk. You can also use sill gasket material. And again, this is more new construction. Um, on This is our segue into existing homes. Um, this is a great picture that um, I definitely have seen this uh, when you have a, a white carpeting and the edge of it is dirty. And it's not that the homeowners are messy people. It's that air was leaking. If this is on an exterior wall, that means air is leaking uh, through that unsealed um, sill plate. If this is an interior wall, it means it was not sealed at the top and attic air is leaking down and then underneath the, the drywall never comes all the way down. And so air is leaking into the building that way. Um, so that that that's a real common kind of a tell of a leakage problem in a house. Um, so when you get into the kind of the more of the weatherization world, um, you know, the, the you go after all the big holes. So this is an example of one of the projects that we weatherize. This is a, a fireplace chase. And here they had started. They used um, plywood in here, and that's fine, um, but there, no one's gonna stand on this. There's no reason you couldn't use, you know, a easier to cut material like foam board or whatever, but that's fine. Um, and here you can see it's been, all the pieces were cut, they were sealed into place. And then because this is a hot surface, um, either a flue pipe or a chimney, we always transition the last, uh, about three inches with um, some sort of metal as a seal and a flashing detail. Um, so we, we can actually attach the flashing to the masonry using a fire rated caulk. It's a more expensive intumescent caulk. It's usually red. Uh, and then we transition to sheet metal and then we can go back to wood or foam board or whatever it is. We're also gonna, um, after all this air sealing is done, we're gonna wrap around the chimney with another piece of sheet metal and that's going to act as a dam so that the loose fill insulation we install doesn't actually touch the hot surface. Um, so here, it's not the best photo, but that was that same attic. And you can see where the, um, the dam here stops the insulation from going up against the fireplace. Um, here's that classic tub photo. I, I took this picture. This is a new home. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, Joey, what do you think? They did remember to seal these mm -hmm. pipe penetrations. But they might have forgotten another hole. <laughs> so the 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 hole here kind of dwarfs the leakage right here, I would say. Um, so the fix on this is to use, you know, I usually run a bead of caulk around it. I put some foam board up into it, put some fasteners to hold the foam board, and then um, use some foam in a can to kind of make the small hole go away. Um, this was actually my own house when I bought my house. I was uh, you always go and look at the plumbing in a crawl space and, and that's, you can almost always find a whole one. I was kind of, I was like, wow, you could fit a really large uh, anything through that. So um, I wanted to seal it. I used a similar technique. I used some caulk and foam board and fasteners and 
Um, while I was working in my crawl space in, in the south, we have these really kind of scary crickets. They're called cave crickets or camel crickets. They're big and they're frightening. And, you know, I'm working on my back and I don't like being in my crawl space. And one of these crickets starts gnawing on my leg. And I started freaking out, Joey. This was really scary. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever had this encounter or attack by a cricket? I, I can't say that I have. Well, I'm sorry you've missed that experience. But it turned out, actually, it wasn't a cricket. It was my wiener dog. So I just thought I'd share that story. I don't know how he got in, <laughs> it's but like it surprised me. It does, he's kind of a cricket. So it really freaked me out. But um, my other story is um, that uh, I was involved in some construction uh, and this is an existing building and a python had literally crawled through unsealed plumbing penetrations. So I, I know pythons are not really indigenous to the, to the North America, but they now are all over Florida. So if I don't know what will motivate you more to air seal uh, than to, um, to uh, keep the pythons out of your house. So I thought I'd share that story. Um, and uh, just to kind of, I'm looking at my time here, just to kind of, uh, keep us moving uh, very common we see you know vent stack pipes like you see in this picture they're in existing homes they're almost always going to be leaks around those you know that's an here's a here's a before and an after of one of those pictures this is some weatherization we did recently um, this was an uh, you know here's some of the the gaps in the top plate that you can see we pulled the insulation. there was a little bit of insulation we pulled it back so we could get access to it sealed it and then we'll come back and add more insulation later um, another big one is if you have a change in ceiling height a lot of times there is no blocking and there's all that chimney cavity basically excuse me that wall cavity acts like a chimney um, and so we want to see blocking there and i realize i i forgot to put in the after picture but this is the before picture of one that we encountered um, so we we probably would use pieces like we probably use foam board and attach it and then spray the edges with there's different ways to seal that some people roll up fiberglass and foam over it um, adding knee walls uh, tons of stories and slides on these but basically this is very common to find in existing homes this is where you have a a second floor built into the roof line and uh, there's a lot of leakage under it because there's no blocking here and there's not enough insulation um, so there's, you can try to fix all this and we'll talk about each of these details. Sometimes it's easier just to sort of say, forget it and run the insulation all the way down. So we'll take a look at that. Um, here's a, here's a buddy of mine who this particular knee wall was a new home. It did have sheathing on it. It had insulated sheathing, which is good, but it didn't have any blocking. So this is the picture he took. And here's the blocking that I'm talking about in this diagram right here. And here's the sheathing that we're talking about. We really arguably should have this knee wall should be insulated. <coughs> Excuse me. I would say something approaching R20 is a good minimum number. The, the same amount of insulation in the attic arguably should be on a knee wall. Um, and uh, here's another picture from weatherization. We're in the attic and you can see there is no blocking here. And uh, that's the knee wall. That's the attic access door. They, they have in the process of weatherizing, they've put foam board on the, the door, which is great. One thing I always want to point out is uh, if you encounter knob and tube, that has to be essentially removed and, and taken out of service before we can do this kind of weatherization effort. Um, here's more kind of new construction. Uh, this one didn't have any blocking, didn't have any sheathing. This one had sheathing. It was a two by six cavity and they had sheathed it and filled it with insulation. So good job them but still no blocking here. And you can see uh, Diane sticking her arm underneath there. Here's a picture where it looks like it's been done pretty well. Um, and we're uh, able to see blocking and some insulated sheathing on the attic side. Um, this is another picture where you're in the attic knee wall and there's the sloped insulation. You can see how dirty it is. Air was washing through that R value of that, or through that bat, so killing the R value. More funny pictures. Here they sheathed it, it looked pretty good, but they sort of forgot a part. And remember we learned last week that small instances of no insulation really hurt your effective R value. This was just un so bizarre, I don't know what to say. It was a furniture built into the attic knee wall. So this person's sweaters were part of their insulation package. <laughs> I don't know. So is that in the weatherization work scope? 
Might be. Um, and again, more of the same new construction, comfort problems galore. Start lifting the bats back, and there's the tub. And you know, what's the R value of the tub? And and so the fix here was basically just to put foam board uh, on the attic side of this to make it a lot better insulated, and of course to do the blocking. Um, last section I want to mention, and we're wrapping up, is I, I we'll probably do more with ductwork, but on weatherization. Um, assuming the duct is actually connected to the boot, that, that, don't don't make a gross assumption there, but it's a good idea to pull the registers and we usually vacuum them out and then take mastic and reach in and start sealing from the inside working your way out. And uh, then when we're all done, we'll seal the boot to the subfloor or if they're in the ceiling to the drywall. Um, so the, here you can see folks doing it in sidewalls, they're vacuuming out the register, um, clearing out the stuff so they can seal the boot to it and then of course masticking and working their way back out and last thing i want to mention is uh window unit air, air conditioners if you know sometimes we encounter people that have window units that still use them and they're you know a lot of times we're weatherizing for elderly folks they're not going to be putting them in taking them out uh and so what we do is we try to put some insulated panels uh, insulated foam boards on the side and sometimes we we or you can make them look a little nicer right covering them with like a, a white tape or something and then um, we clean the filters and clean out the unit with a vac and then basically um, put a piece of plastic on it and the sides and the top are taped and then when it comes summertime you can pull the three sides of tape off and let the flap of plastic hang down and use the unit um, and then lastly, when the window is open partially, there's a gap here. So we, they make gaskets for that. We actually a lot of times just use some pipe insulation that, that is a good application for that. So you can seal that. Just some details to kind of help make a home more weatherized. And Joey, what do you know? I've got 11, I got 11.58 on my clock here. So you want to take over and see if we can spur anybody to do some improvements after attending this webinar. And, uh, All right, should have the poll launch there. So if you want to uh, answer the questions, <laughs> yeah, and and again, uh, we, really we realize emphasize yeah, it this I, I, time, but I, I did recognize a couple of those people in the uh, mastic uh, slide. Yeah, um, but I think yeah. a, a few other people recognize them as well. I'm going to close this poll here and uh, share the results. It looks like uh, about 30% um, are still looking for some of those kids to help uh, seal the <laughs> seal the ducts. 40% um, are going to go after the obvious leak paths in the attic. Um, and uh, that little reminder on your air air filter is, is, is still working in about 15% of the people there. So Good deal. Good deal. All right. Well, I, 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 I definitely appreciate that this has been kind of a a basic uh, weather webinar so far, and you know we're going to do another one on moisture, which is really fun. We could we could spend hours on moisture, but mm -hmm. um, you know once we get past these sort of uh, basic concepts, we'll we'll try to dive a little deeper into some some situations. And again, please share with us your feedback, your comments, your uh, uh, ideas for topics. And I think we're excited that at some point it looks like this is going to be drop a weekly effort but please if you can join us on thursday april 16th and uh, joey anything you want to mention on this yeah we're 12 o'clock again so we understand if you need to to leave uh, <laughs> uh and uh we are going to stick around for just a few minutes if that's all right and do some q a uh, we've had a few come in um so if you have any questions um now's a good time to kind of put those in the q a in the chat and we'll get to them so uh, thanks again for for joining us uh, mike i've got a couple of questions for you if you're ready yeah go for it joe so the first thing i want to do actually if you could go to i believe it's um oh let's see here slide three just to talk about the go to webinar there's some people still um uh, maybe a little confused about how to access the um uh, the handouts so uh, they should uh, if you're asking questions in the Q&A then you should be able to see the handouts it's it's yeah. re it's really just one uh, another little section there if that's not the case then let me know but it should be and if not we do send out the handouts as well as a recording of this webinar after the fact 
Uh, and there's some people asking about last week's webinar, maybe next week's webinar if you can't make it. Uh, we're going to make them all available. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be on YouTube or what, but um, they will be available at some point um, through through one of our channels. So just keep, uh, keep an eye out on our website uh, and uh, keep an eye out on those emails from uh, uh, from Ali, and he'll let, he'll let us know where they're going to be. Um, so there was a question about um, the stack effect, and I think probably um, looks like or, or pressure in general. I, I think uh, maybe the slide 20 or so. Um, maybe even 23, somewhere in there. Uh, someone was asking about how, how this affects radon when you have negative pressure in a home. So if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And um, again, radon might be worthwhile as its own topic, but mm -hmm. um, you know, radon is a, a, if you're not sure, it's a naturally occurring, uh, you know, radioactive decay. It's a soil gas and it wants, it's lighter than air. It wants to rise up. And um, if you're building a new home, there's really no way to, to tell if you're going to be, uh, you know, have a radon problem until the house is, is built. The simple correct answer is you should test. Uh, but um, on an existing home or a newly built home, you know, the radon essentially migrates up. And um, if you are in what's called a radon hotspot, and uh, Metro Atlanta, for example, is a radon hotspot, um, you want to uh, do some radon resistant con uh, construction, but this is a, this is true that if your if your building is kept at a more positive pressure, you are making it less easy for radon to basically get into the living space. Um, so that is correct. Uh, if that was sort of the inferred question, mm -hmm. um, if the if the, um, the the really the right answer I think is with radon is to put in a pathway for it. The nice thing about radon is it it will rise up and out. And so a radon stack is is a, an idea. And if, like if it's in a crawl space, we usually are gonna put the perforated pipe under the plastic and then seal the plastic. And then the perforated pipe, you know, tees into another pipe that goes up. And in new construction, it really makes sense to run that vertical radon vent stack through a wet wall, you know, a, a, a plumbing wall. And then it just uh, literally goes Oh, I, I remember this now. Uh, let's let's try my drawing here. So we've got a, a pipe that goes up through the interior and then is open at the top. And it really is okay if it's open. And then that pipe goes back down into the crawl space or whatever. And then it's in a T. So it's picking up uh, it's picking up radon from all over. I think this drawing is gonna be on sale in the lobby afterwards. Is that true? Um, Oh yeah, maybe, maybe. beautiful. Yeah. So anyway, um, um, so it, you're trying to give radon a, a path out, and yes, mm -hmm. positive pressure will actually have a benefit on that. Go ahead. Um, just uh, uh, some people are very interested in radon, so maybe that'll be a topic for later. Um, okay. There was a question about the can lights. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, someone specifically is asking about some of the LED retrofit kits. Uh, and I'll say I've looked at quite a few of those and some of them do seem to have a good gasket and then uh, they'll apply a good amount of force to kind of uh, create a good um, uh, air seal, but some don't. So you really have to kind of um, look at the, each brand. Uh, of course, in, in retrofits and, and weatherization, uh, this was a question last week, you might have to build a box around it if you don't have uh, the budget to actually replace the fixture. So um, I hate and, those boxes. <laughs> I hate. I know exactly what you're talking about, and yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I realize, and you're right. I guess it could be coming down to the budget, but honestly, I feel like we go out of our way to build a box out of some non-combustible material. And mm -hmm. to your credit, the box is going to make it more airtight. But um, generally, we don't want to insulate on top of that. So you still have. You don't have the leakage, but you still have gaps in your insulation coverage because mm -hmm. that fixture is so old and so crappy and so dangerous that, you know, it could heat up and and that's something we don't want to do. So I, I, I hear you. I understand. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I feel like we just keep pushing a rock against can lights. And, I, and I'm I, I, I switched my tune on this over the years. I, I pretty much just 
want to say get rid of them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's Mike talking. That's not necessarily Joey talking and anybody <laughs> else. So. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you. Sometimes we have to defer yeah. to the the powers that be, unfortunately. I, I, I think that the LED retrofit kits these days are very cost effective, and that'd be my my get. My pick. Yeah, because then you then you get the more efficient light source as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think that that is a that's a valid argument too. So all right, I think if we can go to slide 16, that's your building thermal envelope. Um, we didn't necessarily talk about <laughs> foamed roof lines this week. We talked quite a bit about it last week. Uh, mm-hmm. Basically, uh, we, Mike and I were talking, and we may end up making that an, an entire webinar on itself. But just real quickly, if you do decide to do example three with a foamed roof line. Um, and someone was asking, you know, basically, how does that compare um, air sealing wise to maybe trying to air seal all the gaps and cracks and holes in example one? And I would say, I, in, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, obviously, uh, I mean, I think that the you're going to get a much tighter home with the with the foam because again, you're not. And I kind of maybe uh, spoiled this with the way I asked the question, but you've got to find a lot of little gaps and cracks um, when you're sealing that floor of the attic. So this mm-hmm. uh, typically does a, a much better job. I don't know if that's been your experience, Mike. Yeah, I, I would say um, it's it's more of a hassle factor as much as anything that um uh and i do, and and again i do think we should make this a webinar topic and, and talk about a retrofit uh foam roof lines because i definitely have some opinions on that and some experience with that um i want to uh just say you know really quickly that it it's generally easier for them to foam the roof line and like you said get it nice and tight and get hopefully good insulation coverage uh in that case one of the topics I want to mention is you don't have to air seal the flat anymore. And all those challenging holes and stuff uh, and penetrations, they're not an option anymore. They're not a factor anymore um, because now this is, a, and I'm an advocate of making this a conditioned attic. Mm-hmm. Um, I will also say that if you're going to retrofit this, I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to vacuum out the old loose fill insulation because it is has nothing to do with energy. Uh, it's not going to hurt the building. It's really more of an air quality issue. A lot of times that old insulation is stuff that you just don't want to be breathing in your inside your envelope. And for many years, for 30 years, it was a vented space above it, and whatever critter pooped in it or died in it, it, it was fully vented above it. But now all of a sudden, you're going to put a really good air barrier around it and stick your head in it. It's not a good idea. So um, if you're going to retrofit this, please budget in to remove the old insulation. It doesn't hurt it anything thermally. It's just more about air quality. So uh, good good comment. Mm-hmm. We also have a question about uh, basement, crawl space, and floor uh, encapsulation. Um, and, and probably going to do it. Uh, aren't we probably going to do a webinar on that as well? I think, yeah, right? and I'm just trying to think. I don't think we really covered it. I think this person is especially uh, curious about termite inspections and stuff, and that that's actually built into the code. Um, that, uh, but I don't think we have a good uh, slide on it right now. Yeah, so that, I think uh, that's stay a tuned great question. And, yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. Is stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, um, Joey, I did think of one other thing I wanted to mention that um, depending on what's going on up in your attic, if you don't mm-hmm. have ductwork in your attic um, and, you know, some existing homes, we still encounter homes that don't have any insulation in the attic, uh, for yeah. example. Uh, and and a lot of times there's at least some. But one option is to vacuum out whatever insulation is there and and you could consider laying down a very thin layer of foam to air mm-hmm. seal basically the entire attic and then come on top of that with a, a, a much, you know, a, a brand new layer of loose fill. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sometimes goes by the name of flash and bat or whatever, or flash and, flash and blow. But I think if you don't have ductwork in the attic and you can get this to be very airtight, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that being a vented, you know, um, attic assembly if you do have ductwork mm-hmm. in the attic that's the that's the deciding factor generally about should i foam the roof line or not that's that's usually the bigger deal 
Um, and then someone's asking if you have vermiculite insulation, uh, should it be tested for asbestos? Um, I mean, if, if you're asking from a weatherization standpoint, that's always going to depend on your state and your, uh, how your agency, but, uh, best, best, uh, practice would be to absolutely test that before you disturb it at all. Right. Um, yeah. You know, kind of depend on where you live, if, if that's common in your area. Uh, we've had some questions this week and also uh, last week about um, specific ventilation strategies or uh, humidification strategies uh, to potentially deal with the ongoing uh, virus and everything. And, and that might be <laughs> something we have to bring in some, some real experts. But um, it, as far well, as ventilation is concerned, if you've got a few extra members of your house uh, live, hanging around 24 hours a day, um, I can say specifically in Atlanta these days, it's a great day to open up a window if you can deal yep. with the allergies uh, <laughs> and, and, and make sure that you, you know, you get some get some fresh air um, through your windows and also through through maybe leaving the house once or twice if you can. De definitely would agree with that. And, um, you know, in most of the, you know, the hot, mixed, humid climate zones, it's we're not so much worried about not enough humidity um, as we are too much. But um, mm -hmm. I would say if you would like to have uh, higher humidity levels in your home, I'm a bigger advocate of a uh, room humidifier, the, the yeah. kind, the, the atomizing type. What, and, and my reason for that is um, I like that you're, you see the source of water. If it looks, you know, starts to grow something on it, you're going to clean it. Mm -hmm. uh you know it's right there and um but i i would say that at least in the in the the southeast uh, a room humidifier is is really more of a band-aid for a leaky house in the winter time and that's mm -hmm. the only time you'd ever need it and i can speak from experience that we used to use a room humidifier and once we encapsulated our crawl space and conditioned the crawl space uh now it getting too dry is not an issue anymore. So um, in the winter, so that that was a you know cold air infiltrates in and dries out. We'll learn more about that on Thursday. So that's a good teaser for some. <laughs> so yeah, that's great. All right. Uh, there's someone asking about the acoustical value of just leaving in that insulation instead of um, sucking it all out. Uh, in the in the foam application we were talking about earlier in the yeah. retrofit. Um, yeah, fair, but, mm -hmm. you know, I guess I would say, um, you know, let's just say it's a fairly new installation and it's bats and it's, it's not friable and I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, I would kind of say the acoustic benefit to me doesn't outweigh the uh, indoor air quality concern. So that, that's, that's my perspective on that. Others may feel differently. Okay. Well, the questions have kind of died down. Uh, we're we're getting Perfect. some some drop offs here. So, uh, if you do uh, come up with any questions, we're available. Um, I believe there was an introductory slide here that had both of our emails. So, send us any questions that you have. Again, topics for webinars uh, and any other feedback that you have. Uh, Mike, do you have anything else? No, I just want to say again, thanks to everybody. It looks like we had almost, you know, pushing 200 folks on both of these webinars, which is fantastic. So thanks again, and uh, keep your feedback coming in, and hopefully we'll we'll see you again in the virtual sense on Thursday. All right. Thank you very much.